No Credits Roll. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 8 of No Credits Rolled. My name is Sam Whalen and today we're going to be talking about some depressing gaming news, unfortunately, uh, as well as my thoughts on Fallout 76 and Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. I'm sure you've all been eagerly anticipating my Suicide Squad review. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that the fine folks over at Philly Drinkers have partnered with the show to provide you awesome Philly sports merch for all your favorite teams. Unfortunately, the Sixers have bounced, but the Phillies are red hot right now, so make sure to check out Philly Drinkers for all your Philadelphia sports merch needs. Use the link in the description to get a discount, and every purchase helps out the show. There's also one other thing I wanted to touch on before we get into the news. Uh, We, of course, have a call in line here. Uh, and someone was actually nice enough to call in this time. See if you recognize the voice. Sam! Hello! Sean here. Uh, I'm the actor behind Scratch in Baldur's Gate 3. I hope you're keeping well, friend. Uh, a little birdie told me that you are starting your own podcast, talking about video games and Baldur's Gate 3, no less, which I think is absolutely awesome, and I can't wait to listen in. So I thought, what better way to start things off for you than by giving you some Scratch facts from Baldur's Gate 3. Are you ready? Let's go. One, having Scratch in your party is useful for many different things. Not only can he find items without the need for a survival check, but he can also give you an additional perception check. He can revive fallen enemies with his lick, and also he can break concentration saving throws. Cool one. The best boy of many tricks and talents. Two, If you have Speak With Animals, our favourite spell and feature, am I right? And you have Scratch in your party running around Faerun, when he barks to let you know that he's found something, that is actually me doing the barking. So the barking with Speak With Animals is different to without. Three. Baldur's Gate had approximately 17,000 strands of ending, which is crazy. Um, So just imagine how many versions of the lines we had to record as well. So with Scratch, I mean, there was... If you found the owlbear, if you didn't have the owlbear, um, there's obviously all the different gender options as well, male, female, non-binary. There's, uh, if you're in favour, if you're not in favour with Scratch, yes, I know there's a, there's a kind of approval thing as well. Um, so the options are multiple. Just imagine how complicated the epilogue was to write. What I love about the video game world or industry is the community. I've honestly never met as passionate and dedicated and close-knit a community as that of Baldur's Gate 3. It's, I really do think that the people are what make games special. The players, obviously. So I think running a podcast on, on video games, it's, it's a fundamental part of the community. So, you know, what better way than to celebrate the worlds we love, right? So, Slam, from me, Sean, and from Scratch, the best boy in all of Faerun, we wish you all the very best in the podcasts and games and adventures that you're going to cover. We have no doubt that it's going to be awesome. Yeah, that's right, folks. That is, in fact, Sean Mendham, the voice of Scratch the Dog from Baldur's Gate 3, one of my favorite characters. And I'm sure if you've met Scratch in Baldur's Gate 3, he's one of your favorite characters as well. My friend Joe, who we had on the show before a couple episodes ago to talk about Helldivers and Baldur's Gate, Uh, Joe was nice enough to get me a cameo for the show, so thanks to Joe and thanks to Sean as well. Um, You know, there's a lot of people that go into making a game, uh, and it's always nice to hear from some of the talent too. But of course, you can always call in. I just got to plug the phone phone line while I can. You can always call in at 856-209-0713. Of course, that's 856-209-0713. And I'd like to hear from you too. All right, enough dilly-dallying. Let's get into the show. So yes, I did uh, tease it at the beginning. We do have some depressing news today uh, to cover, and that is, of course, the Xbox layoffs. Uh, It always sucks to talk about layoffs, um, but Xbox recently announced it was closing a handful of studios. This included Arcane Austin, they created Redfall, uh, but also the Dishonored series, Prey, and Deathloop. Uh, Microsoft also announced the closure of Tango Gameworks. They created Hi-Fi Rush. Uh, which was widely seen as a success for Xbox at the time, uh, especially at a time when the brand was really struggling. You know, Hi-Fi Rush kind of shadow dropped, came out of nowhere, and and people loved it. And, you know, I've only played, a you know, maybe an hour or two of it. I really do want to complete it, uh, and it's something I would talk about on this show if I did play it. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But I know that it was very widely accepted, um, you know, as a great game. 
Uh, also, Alpha Dog Games is being closed. Uh, they're a mobile game developer. They made a game called Wraithborn in 2012, and uh, the recent game Mighty Doom, which is a Doom mobile game. I actually did check that out. I uh, played that a little bit. Uh, it's, you know, it's a Doom mobile game, but of course, you hate to see anyone get laid off, uh, no matter what kind of stuff they're working on. Uh, of course, all three of these studios are uh, affiliated with Bethesda Studios. Microsoft acquired ZeniMax Media, which is Bethesda's parent company, uh, for $7.5 billion back in 2021. And it was a big deal at the time. I think I talked about it on Insights Into Things. I believe we... Oh, no, we did a one for the Activision Blizzard thing. Uh, but either way, this that Bethesda acquisition was one of those things, those dominoes we talk about when we talk about Microsoft setting up the dominoes, waiting for this big payoff. Uh, and... This is kind of the opposite of that, where you acquire a studio and now you're doing these big layoffs. Uh, and in some cases, when these studios are producing games that are critically successful and you're shuttering them, how does that make you look? Not super great. You know, when people think Bethesda, they think Elder Scrolls VI. Uh, they think maybe a new Fallout game with the success of the Fallout show. Uh, but there's other things that Bethesda does. You know, those Dishonored games, people were really hoping to get a third one of those. Doesn't look like that's going to happen now. Prey, people love that Prey game. I enjoyed it. Now, again, didn't finish it. No credits rolled. What do you expect? Um, but Arkane Austin was really known for these, um, these like open world. Uh, what am I trying to think of here? Like the intricate uh, first person games. I mean, Deathloop. Everybody loved that game. I wasn't a big fan of it. Uh, people love Deathloop. I think it won all kinds of awards when it came out. I might have won Game of the Year. I should probably fact check that. Um, of course, they had Redfall, right, which was not well received critically or financially. Um, but they were working on it, right? There was a Redfall update that was supposed to come out. There was DLC that was still being worked on at the time of this closure. Um, so who knows what's going to happen with that? And, you know, if that game's even going to be given... A chance at a second chance, if that makes any sense. So at the time of uh, this recording, this is all pretty fresh in the news cycle, right? There's a lot of strong emotions, a lot is still unknown, a lot is still to come. Uh, there are rumors that there's going to be more cuts. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds this week because I don't want to speak out of turn or, you know, sort of shoot from the hip. Uh, but I feel like I couldn't, if we're going to talk about the news, we have to talk about this, right? It's I'm not a news outlet, but I do have some sort of obligation to cover these big stories. And and this is definitely a big story this week. Uh, like I said, more cuts are rumored to be coming, but we're going to have to wait and see what happens there. Uh, you hate to see it no matter what. Um, it's tough to see. Uh, layoffs suck, right? Everybody, everybody knows that. I don't think anybody would agree. Anybody would say that layoffs are a fun thing. Uh, personally, I've seen layoffs in my industry uh, recently. You know, everybody's favorite holiday uh, is the end of quarter one when these cuts tend to happen. Uh, I'm seeing it now, seeing it now. Friends, I've got friends that were laid off, friends that were cut. Uh, it all comes down to the bottom line. You know, I, I know there are economic justifications for layoff. Um, if you are in that position to be making those kind of decisions. Uh, but, you know, it's, I don't, no, if I care. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, people are buying into an industry, right? You're buying into the industry you want to pursue with the hope that they can provide for their families and themselves. And and with that, hopefully comes a sense of job security. But we're seeing time and time again that there isn't job security, um, whether that be in the gaming industry that has had all kinds of layoffs almost on a weekly basis or in another industry where you think you are in a secure position and then all of a sudden cuts come around again and, and your name's on the list. You know, like I said, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds and I'm, you know, I'm only 24, so I haven't uh, maybe accepted the way that the world seems to work. But if companies continuously put themselves in positions where layoffs are expected, where layoffs are part of the plan, maybe there's something wrong with the plan in the first place, right? Maybe we need to make a world or a system where you know, practices of overhiring or, or downsizing or studio consolidations where these things don't need to happen, where people can land the job they want and feel safe in that job and not have to worry about, you know, the hangman coming around every couple months or so and people getting fired because, you know, profits for the entire company are down or need to be up. And because those profits can always be higher, 
thanks to capitalism, you know, maybe we're never going to be able to satisfy that beast. I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely rambling at this point. So back on track to Xbox. What does this mean for Xbox? I asked that question a lot. Uh, we've all been waiting for Xbox to have their big moment with all these game studio acquisitions, you know, Bethesda, Activision. I saw rumors that they're thinking about putting Call of Duty on Games Pass. What are they doing, right? What is their plan going forward? If acquisitions just lead to layoffs, what is the end game? I mean, Tango Gameworks was a critical success or had a critical success with Hi-Fi Rush. Unfortunately, financially, the numbers were hurt with the game releasing on Games Pass, which we've talked about before, either on this show or on Insights into Things. When things come out on Games Pass, while more people are able to access it, from a financial point of view, you're typically going to lose money because you're, I believe... You are paid a sum, right? You are paid up front by Xbox to acquire this game. And then on Games Pass, you lose some of that revenue from someone just buying the game outright because they're just going to wait for it to come to Games Pass. I mean, that's how I played Hi-Fi Rush was because it Shadow dropped on Games Pass that day. Uh, but when your Xbox sets up a system where we say, hey, we're going to acquire your studio, we're going to publish your game, and we're going to publish it on Games Pass, and then we're going to can your studio when it doesn't financially perform well. But because it's on Games Pass is part of the reason why it's not financially performing well. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and it doesn't really add up. Um, this is a quote from Aaron Greenberg, who was Xbox's marketing vice president. This is back in 2023. Uh, the, back in 2023, there were rumors about Hi-Fi Rush not performing well financially. So Greenberg came out and said this. Uh, he says, quote, uh, Hi-Fi Rush was a breakout hit for us and our players in all key measurements and expectations. We couldn't be happier with what the team at Tango Gameworks delivered with this surprise release. Uh, well, it turns out they could be happier because they ended up, you know, closing the studio. So, I don't know. I don't know if maybe that was just corporate speak at the time to kind of quell those rumors and preserve Microsoft's initiative with these studios going forward. But, I mean, there's tons of clips you can find online of, you know, guys like Phil Spencer and all them going on different shows. Uh, the Kind of Funny X-Cast in particular. Phil did a big thing last year after Redfall came out, a big interview, uh, taking a lot of uh, personal accountability for it. But there are statements in even that interview that are now coming into question because of how Xbox is treating these studios. And, you know, Phil Phil Spencer's one guy, right? He's not He's not like this evil, maniacal overlord that is making all these decisions. There's a lot of people behind the scenes at the, the level higher up in the company that are making these decisions. And of course, at the end of the day, these are all human beings that make these decisions. But when it comes to the corporate side of things, I, I have a difficult time um, remembering that. So it's just worth saying. Um, so yeah, Xbox acquires studios. And then, like I just said, puts their games on games pass impact sales, and then isn't happy with the sales. There seems to be some kind of logic breakdown here. Uh, this is also right after a couple months ago, hi-fi rush became multi-platform, right? It was one of those Xbox games that got put out on PlayStation. This included sea of thieves and grounded. I guess it was too little too late, right? In terms of profit, they didn't make enough money with this multi-platform deal or I think of this would have gotten done sooner maybe you would have seen more benefit, right? If it wasn't just the Games Pass ecosystem, then maybe they would have had more sales in general for the game. But it really just seems like Xbox is just pivoting left and right with what they want to do going forward. And it's not a good look, I don't think. I don't have it in the notes here, but I do know we're waiting on the Indiana Jones game. Uh, let me just verify that that is being published by ZeniMax. Yeah, so Indiana Jones and the Great Circle, it's developed by Machine Games, who are the Wolfenstein people, but it's being published by Bethesda. So, you know, maybe Bethesda will be able to kind of um, recoup from this if that Indiana Jones game comes out and is a big hit, which I suspect it will be, barring it being terrible. Uh, out of You know, it, all of the signs are pointing that it should be a good game, but we've been disappointed in the past. We'll have to wait and see. I don't know what the plan is for Xbox now, right? I could probably do another whole episode on this. I did an episode on it before, a little more optimistically looking at Xbox plans going forward. But with the treatment of this and the, sh the shuttering of all these Bethesda studios, it's difficult to see what the plan is next. And is this the end of, not the end, but this is a big hit on Xbox's plan of acquiring these studios and making games out of them, or making games from them. Um, 
it's not a good look, especially if you are a studio that Xbox is looking to acquire and you say, well, this is how you treated these Bethesda devs. How are you going to treat us? You know, I don't know. It's it's not a good look, <laughs> bottom line. Uh, but hey, you know, maybe Elder Scrolls Six will fix all of our problems uh, when it comes out in 25 years. Anyway, moving on to story number two today, we've got some Helldivers drama. Uh, I'm sure you have seen this story. It's pretty tough to avoid. Uh, but speaking of companies taking, uh, speaking of companies tanking their own brand, let's talk about Sony and the recent Helldivers Two fiasco. Uh, that's right, folks. The Xbox and the Sony ponies. No one's safe this week. I'm coming after both of you. Um, anyway, despite it seeming to dominate the gaming news feed, believe it or not, this this story has only been going on for like a week. Um, it started back on May the third when Sony announced that Steam players would have to link a PlayStation Network account in order to play Helldivers 2. At the time, uh, this was from a community post on Steam, their justification was due to the, quote, technical issues the game faced and at launch that prevented this change from being mandatory, saying that the, quote, grace period was now over. The grace period for linking your account. Uh, they also said safety was a concern, saying that the priority was, quote, protecting our players and upholding the values of safety and security provided on PlayStation and PlayStation Studios games. Which, you can take that with a grain of salt, considering the massive amount of data leaks that Sony has had in the last couple of years. Uh, but, yeah, player safety was a allegedly one of the concerns they cited. Uh, now, PC gamers are one of those groups you definitely don't want to piss off. Uh, and those without those PC gamers on Steam, without PSN accounts, or who just didn't want to do this, uh, were justifiably angry with this change. Uh, it's worth keeping in mind that Helldivers 2 was Sony's largest PC launch ever, uh, they've been doing a lot of PC ports of games like Last of Us, which I don't think worked too well because the port was bad. Uh, Spider-Man, they're, they've mostly been dealing in ports. Uh, but Helldivers was one of the first games that was a Sony interactive entertainment launch that was huge. I mean, obviously, I've talked about Helldivers on the show before. Big fan. But the PC community also latched onto this game because of, you know... I don't know why. <laughs> it's popular to play with your friends, and using the Steam ecosystem is probably even easier. And this linking, forcing people to have a PSN account attached to it, kind of came out of nowhere. Um, well, that's not necessarily true. Because you can see when uh, you initially were to sign up for the game that it did say that this link could become a possibility, uh, and there's screenshots of that you can find online of it, of it saying that. So people should have been aware of this, but I think the idea was that it took them so long without doing it that they, that, you know, PC gamers just assumed it was never going to happen. And not to mention what the runaway success of Helldivers 2, all the technical issues that it had at launch, it seemed like they were just going to let this sleeping dog lie and not, not have to worry about the potential backlash. Um, well, that wasn't the case. <laughs> uh, so after this announcement, people began review bombing the game. I think... I have the number 14,000 negative reviews here, but I saw another source saying 20,000 reviews once it was all said and done. A bunch of negative reviews posted on Steam tanking this game's, uh, what's the what's the word, the, the, the review score, I guess. You know, on Steam where it says mostly positive, overwhelmingly positive, mostly negative, whatever that score is, the user rating. So with, you know, 14,000 to 20,000 negative reviews, it obviously tanked the game's review score and you had um, people from Arrowhead, you know, jokingly tweeting, ooh, right in the review, like, you know, hit us right in the review score, uh, as well as a, a ton of angry tweets, Discord posts, just a lot of public outrage uh, from the held average community as a whole, not just the PC gamers, but everybody. I mean, nobody seemed to be, you know, on board for this. Uh, for the record, I I agree this was a ridiculous decision on Sony's part. Uh, it definitely reads as tone deaf. Uh, I'm I'm poking fun at PC gamers. I just find it funny when gamers come together on anything and get all worked up. It's just the passion. Uh, I find it amusing. There are a lot of issues in the world, but I'm glad that we can rally and save Helldivers 2. I'm glad that that is where we can direct our energy. Uh, it's also worth noting there are 177 countries where you simply can't make a PSN account, and Sony went ahead and delisted Helldivers 2 in those countries. Uh, that's pretty bad. Uh, consider, you know, 177 countries where you can no longer buy the game. Who knows how that's going to affect sales? Uh, I'll skip to the end a little bit here for that. Uh, 
Now, spoilers, as of this recording, those 177 countries still are delisted and still cannot buy the game. Or the countries aren't delisted. The game is delisted in those countries, and you still can't purchase the game. Uh, so that's sort of the last lingering question because, of course, if you've heard, Sony did end up reversing this decision just days later after the public outcry. So once again, complaining works, uh, especially when you're very, very loud about it. Uh, people were also threatening to boycott the game, the review bums. It was just a lot of a lot of backlash that I think Sony really couldn't avoid. Uh, there are now there's now a community made operation in the in if you don't know in Hell Divers two there are uh, operations that are basically player wide that if you com- if the whole player base completes the operation you get some kind of reward. Well, to deal with the negative review scores for the game, there was a community made operation in real life, which I don't know if most gamers are familiar with, uh, called Operation Cleanup, which now encourages players to leave positive Steam scores to correct the rating. So this shows that, you know, the Helldivers community is is really special, for better or worse. You had the negativity side of it when, the you know, review bombing and things like that, which you could say is justifiable considering the Shooting so you know the sh- the shooting of the foot that Sony did making this link thing a uh, possibility, and how many people they were alienating from the game because of it. But then you also see the positive side, right? The reversing of this review bombing now that things have been corrected, that this this link has been uh, done away with. We are trying to make things right, and by we I mean them, because I didn't do that. Uh, a fun note, well, this is not fun at all, actually. I don't know why I said that. An interesting note, uh, the Helldivers 2 community manager was fired during this whole debacle uh, for encouraging people to refund and negatively, negatively review the game. Uh, they did have a hilarious quote. Uh, they said, quote, generally it's not a good idea to tell people to refund and leave negative reviews when you're a community manager. He said, they said, I appreciate all the support and appreciate even more that everyone can play the game again without restrictions. I knew I was taking a risk with what I said about refunding and changing reviews. I stand by it. And you got to respect that, right? You got to respect standing by your guns, uh, especially in an age where, you know, when these cuts happen, people are terrified to speak out against the company doing the cuts because they don't want to get fired. When in reality, the the company really doesn't care about you in the first place. Uh, So it's nice to see someone saying saying what they think and, and sticking by it, even if it did lead to them losing their job. At least they've still got their convictions, which... You can't really pay your bills with convictions, but, you know, it's nice to see that sometimes anyway. I think overall this shows how dedicated this Helldivers fan base is, and it also shows, I said it before, but it shows how tone-deaf Sony can be. Um, You know, they had a money-printing machine in Helldivers 2, and they basically poured water on it. And with those 177 countries still delisted, I wonder how this is going to affect Helldivers 2 going forward. Is this a permanent stain on the game, or is it going to bounce back? Personally, I think it's going to bounce back. I think the game is undeniable in so many ways. I mean, it's still ridiculously popular months after coming out. My friends and I still play it. It's in our regular rotation. New players are getting on all the time. I just hope that Sony takes this as a lesson for, one, how important this game is right now for their brand and for their lineup of games, and, two, you know, how to not make this mistake again, right, to be a little bit more conscious of, of how vocal this community can be and how, uh, you know, how bought in they are on this game. And and that can pay off if you leverage it properly, not tanking the game, but instead rewarding that kind of dedication and player base. But anyway, that's going to wrap up the news portion for today's show. Uh, you know, like I said, some depressing stuff. You know, you hate to talk about layoffs, but it's, it is news and it's something that is not going to go away if it's going to keep happening. Uh, and of course, with the Sony blunder here with Helldivers 2, it's, uh, you know, corporations making decisions that are questionable. Uh, but anyway, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to get into the review portion of the show. You're listening to No Credits Rolled. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. 
We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. All right, we're back on No Credits Rolled. Now it's time for the review portion of the show. First game we've got here is Fallout 76. Yes, that's right, folks. We're doing back-to-back weeks of Fallout reviews. Uh, For both of the games that I have to talk about today, I don't really have a whole lot to say. I've only just started both of them. But I did want to include them in the show just because I like to do reviews for these shows, you know, either way. But I just wanted to give that caveat, you know, take what I say with a grain of salt. You should always take what I say with a grain of salt, but in particular with these two reviews, just because I'm only a couple hours into each game. So if you don't know, Fallout 76 is the latest entry in the Fallout series. It came out a while ago still, but technically it's the latest entry. And it's Bethesda's attempt at a semi-MMO set in the Fallout universe. Uh, Like I said, I'm I'm in the very early game still, but it's still got that addicting gameplay loop of any Fallout game that I've played. It's still fun to explore the environment and find, you know, environmental storytelling or or things on data logs or computers and just existing in this wasteland. This time around, it's actually not much of a wasteland. It's set in uh, Appalachia, so you've got a lot more woods, a lot more trees, and you got a little bit of that in Fallout 4, but most people know Fallout 3 in New Vegas. It's a much more barren wasteland, a lot more open, vast spaces of nothingness, Fallout 76 is not really like that. It's uh, lots of woods, mountainous terrain. It's different, which I really like, and it's one of the reasons I'm coming back to it is because I I really do like exploring this environment and seeing the variety in the uh, design and the the trees and things like that. It's, It's unique, and I think it's cool. You know, I described Fallout New Vegas as a vibes game. 76 is no different. I think in general Fallout is a vibes game. It's a vibes series And I said last week I hate using the term vibes, but I'm going to do it again. Uh, It's fun to just put put that radio on and just kind of wander the wasteland. For me personally, that really never gets old. Even if I'm just walking, you know, instantly shooting something and instantly killing it without much of a fight. It's fun to just exist in that universe with the music, with the the atmosphere of those games. And this game as well, I kind of just hang out. Uh, the gameplay itself is pretty slow-paced, as you'd expect from a Fallout game. It does take a lot of notes from Fallout 4 in terms of how they changed the combat in that game. A lot of quality of life stuff. The guns are pretty similar to what you find in Fallout 4 as well. A lot of the, the uh, They introduced these pipe weapons that were part of their push to make guns moddable. A lot of crafting involved in Fallout 4. All those systems exist in 76, right? The base building that they had in 4... The gun modification, the armor modification, all that stuff got put into 76 as part of making it like an MMO. And they've really doubled down on those mechanics as well. The combat is definitely not the highlight of this game, and I didn't really go into it expecting it to be. It's the storytelling. It's the environment. It's wandering around, like I've said a bunch of times in this review. I'm still finding cool side quests and stories as I journey through the world, but I'm... Basically, so far, only fighting small animals, you know, large. uh, There's these naked mole rats you can basically one-shot. There's uh, these really terrifying possum creatures. I really don't like them. I don't know what they're called in the game, but it's like a mutated possum. It's it's like the size of a a tire, and it's got like two heads. Uh, Possums in general just kind of freak me out, so having two heads is kind of a problem. Uh, This is an anti-possum podcast. I hate to break it to you. Um, but the design is cool and it's something we haven't seen in a fallout game before. You know, you expect rad roaches or bloat flies and things like that, but because it's in a different setting, it's presenting these new enemy types. Uh, the main enemies I've been fighting are the scorched, which are a lot like ghouls, but apparently different. They're like these zombies that run at you and you shoot them and they die pretty much immediately. Sometimes they have guns. Uh, I know there are different 
scorched enemies. Like I briefly saw a scorched beast, which is like a dragon. It looked like a dragon. I don't know what it's what it's supposed to be. Uh, like I said, I'm very early in the game, but I do hope we get a little bit more enemy variety from the scorched because so far it has just been these basically ghouls that you'd find in another Fallout game, but they're never really much of a threat. I've never gotten close to dying. Uh, I've got like 50 stims, so even if I did, I could just instantly heal. But again, the combat is really not what's drawing me in here. It's 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 the exploration. Uh, I've attempted to con my friends into downloading it, so I'm curious how the Fallout game will feel when you're not alone, right? So much of this game is about being alone and wandering. What is that like when you've got friends with you and you're all wandering together? Will it be boring? Maybe. We'll see. Hey, but this game definitely has its hooks in me. I keep wanting to pop on, walk around for a bit, or, or just complete one more quest. And those are the aspects that remind me a lot of an MMO. I played a lot of uh, Star Wars The Old Republic Online, and it was that drive of just, all right, let me accept all these quests, wander out into the open world, and then come back and turn in all these quests, and you get that dopamine rush, you know, turning in quest after quest after quest, seeing your XP go up. It's a fun gameplay loop, and I think they've implemented that well in the Fallout uh, gameplay system. Like I said, they've kept a lot of the base building stuff. Now it's a camp system, where you've got a camp hub, essentially, but you can move the camp as you explore the open world. I haven't really figured out what the point of this is yet. You can definitely build a base, but for where I'm at now, I'm moving my camp a lot because I have to, you know, you need your chest where you dump your extra loot or you need crafting benches, which you all have to craft every time you make a new camp, by the way, which is annoying. But I wonder if as you get further into the game, if you're supposed to establish a more permanent base and I guess that would tie in with the PvP elements of the game because there is PvP. If you want it, you can find that. You can fight other players. Uh, and I've seen, you know, the the map is actually uh, a highlight of the game. It's designed like a like a map you'd see for like a um, a national park or like a theme park, which is a which is different from the other Fallout games. It's really cool. Uh, it's fun to look at that map. It's got all kinds of little designs on it. But you can also see other player bases and other player encampments. So I've seen those. I haven't encountered any other players yet. But I know that they're out there, and I wonder if that is where that camp system will come into play. So far, I'm just playing it like a single-player Fallout game. So we'll see what that's like once I get into those multiplayer aspects. But yeah, that's pretty much all I got for Fallout 76 so far. Like I said, still very early in the game, but I'm still enjoying it. You know, it's definitely got its hooks in me. And even though it is semi-mindless, I, I still enjoy getting in there, leveling up, getting... New gear, exploring new environments. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the game is free, not free, but if you've got something like a Games Pass or the Sony PlayStation equivalent of a Games Pass, it's up a lot of places. I know Amazon was just giving it away for the Fallout show. Um, so you can probably pick it up severely discounted or maybe free if you've got any one of these services. So the second game I want to talk about today is Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. Still a mouthful of a title, all these months later. I know I did cover maybe the first episode of this show. I covered this game and its sales numbers and how disappointing people found it. Despite that, I've personally been very excited to talk about this game for a while. Uh, and thankfully, Gamefly came through. I'm not sponsored by Gamefly. Not yet. I'd like to be. Uh, but I have signed up for Gamefly sort of for this show because, you know, I, I've i been duped before buying games only to have them become available on Games Pass or PlayStation Games Pass the next day or to have them get discounted or to just buy a game and not like it and I'm just stuck with that purchase. Uh, so with Gamefly, I'm able to sort of skirt that and pay one flat fee per month and get those games one at a time, play them. If I don't like them, send them back, no problem. Again, not sponsored, but I'd like to be. Anyway, back to Suicide Squad. I know this game did not, re uh, did not get well-reviewed. But it seemed like something that might be up my alley. I know I talked about that when I covered it before, about enjoying that kind of mindless looter-shooter grind of something like a Destiny or a Borderlands, and that was what this game looked like, and that's pretty much what this game is. So far, I've only put maybe five to six hours in. I haven't even killed a Justice League member yet. I know, you're saying, Sam, what is even the point you're supposed to kill the Justice League? Well, I'm taking every side quest possible just to get the right gear. Because uh, they basically make you do that before you do the big Justice League mission, Justice League member mission. The first one you get is a Green Lantern fight. But you've got to level and grind to get the right gear. It is the most bare bones, 
cut and dry uh, grind you can imagine. Um, so if you don't like that, you're not going to enjoy this game. Uh, it turns out, you know, a lot of those reviews were accurate. The game is very aggressively mid, middle of the road. Um, it is it is a looter shooter in, like I said, in the most bare bones of sense. You are shooting and you sometimes get loot. Some pros, all right? Let's start with the pros. I'm coming very negative at this, but there are pros. The visuals in cutscenes, I want to emphasize that, in cutscenes are great. Uh, the game is graphically very impressive, in particular when it comes to character models. Uh, when there are close-ups on characters like Harley Quinn and Captain Boomerang especially, they look fantastic. You know, you got, it's the team behind the Arkham games, so you still have that visual fidelity that they've always had, even going back all the way to Arkham City and Arkham, or, uh, Arkham Asylum. Uh, obviously those games are a little bit older, but they still had the art direction to back it up, which still lets them hold up to this day. In this case, it's mostly just graphics, just graphical power. And like I said, Harley Quinn and Captain Boomerang in particular are really standouts in terms of looking like real human beings. Uh, King Shark, it's a little bit tough because he's a shark, and Deadshot wears a helmet a lot of the time, so what are you going to do? Another pro, the traversal is fun. Uh, It's a bit janky depending on what character you use. They In the beginning of the game, before you pick a character to start the actual campaign with, they have you play as all four characters so you can kind of get a feel for them. I started my main campaign as Captain Boomerang just because I think the Flash is cool and I wanted to have Flash powers, which is which is what Captain Boomerang has. But recently I switched to Deadshot because I had heard that he was the most fun character to play as, uh, and that is correct. Deadshot is by far the most fun character to play as. He's got a jetpack, which is way cooler than anything else that any other character has. Uh, King Shark just kind of jumps. He's like the Hulk, sort of. Harley Quinn has a grapple hook, which they try to emulate the grapple hook. Um, if you've played in the Arkham games, the grapple hook tether and then overshoot and diving and there's no gliding. It's just the grapple hook. She kind of swings like Spider-Man. But they really, I really think they botched it. It does not feel as good as it did in those Arkham games, which is a shame because you'd think that they would just be able to translate that one-to-one and have it work. But the biggest, well, actually, I'll save that for the cons part. I'm still in the pros part, believe it or not. The uh, Deadshot. Deadshot's a lot of fun. It's it's For Captain Boomerang, I stopped playing as him because it's, it's a very cool concept. He essentially has speed force gauntlets that lets him teleport. Uh, but it's it's tough to make that fun in gameplay when you're just sitting there waiting for your boomerang to get somewhere so you can teleport to it. You're just watching it fly. Uh, it's the same thing that happened in Gotham Knights, if anybody ever played that. Uh, Tim Drake in that game, Robin... He also teleported, and you essentially were just sitting there waiting to select a point to teleport to, which is not fun, inherently, I don't think. It defeats the point of traversal when you're just teleporting, zipping from location to location. Um, Like I said, uh, Deadshot has a jetpack, so you can fly in any direction. Then you can also, there's like an afterburner thing you can do where you can boost. Then if you get uh, too close to overheating, you can hit another button, and he kind of does like a little jump, which gives you another bar of jetpack, which then... You know, you can continue flying. So it's it's kind of a fun dance controlling uh, your overheating with your, your boost, with your which way you want to go before you get to the next rooftop, before you overheat. And I did find that pretty enjoyable. Uh, but now on to the cons. Uh, the cons are pretty much everything else. Uh, the gunplay is pretty boring with all the characters feeling very similar. I mean, they even can overlap in their guns, right? I, Deadshot can use a revolver. Harley Quinn can use a revolver. Um, there's revolvers, SMGs, assault rifles, snipers, and shotguns, and then only King Shark can use heavy LMGs like a minigun. For the most part, a lot of these guns overlap between the different characters. So everybody kind of ends up feeling the same. You, everyone just shoots guns, and that's it. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's surprising. Especially when you've got these distinct characters, why would you not make them feel distinct? I mean, they all have their own travel methods, their own traversal methods, but when it comes down to the actual gunplay, it's you're just shooting people. Um, I found that Deadshot, again, is a lot of fun because he can hover in midair with his jetpack to shoot, so that's a little bit different than a Captain Boomerang who you can zip around to a certain extent, but at the end of the day, you have a shotgun, so you're zipping in, uh, blasting with a shotgun, zipping away. It, it sounds kind of fun when I describe it like that, but it, it's really not. You're At the end of the day, you're just shooting everything in the head. Uh, there are also... 
a lot of weird aspects to the gunplay. There, there's this thing called counter shots, where if something is about to shoot you or just shot you, you can do a counter shot, which sometimes breaks its shield, so then you can damage it. There are uh, There's a shield recharge mechanic where if you shoot enemies in the legs, you can then do a melee attack on them and recharge your shield, and that's the only way to get shield back. Uh, it's really strange. It was like they were confined to this gun mechanic the fact that everybody has to shoot guns and then they wanted to make it feel unique and kind of do their own thing within the world of it being a third person shooter. It ends up just being really complicated because you end up getting mission after mission where the, the gimmick of the mission is, well, this enemy will only take damage if you counter shot him, which just means you're sitting there waiting, doing no damage to this enemy until your counter shot recharges. Then you shoot him with that. Then you can do damage. It just like, (laughs) it just like, artificially extends the gameplay. Uh, So that's not fun. Uh, The biggest issue, well, one of the biggest issues I've encountered is in gameplay. The gameplay is like ridiculously visually noisy. I sent a clip to Joe the other day of all the things popping up on screen. And you, you can read anybody's review or look at anybody's review or gameplay and you'll see it right away. The amount of things that pop up on screen, but from damage numbers to health to objective markers to just visual effects, it is overwhelming. And, you know, I obviously, I play a lot of video games. I've been playing games my whole life. It takes a lot for me to become visually overwhelmed. And this game did it pretty much right away. Like to the point where I had no idea what was happening sometimes because I'm I'm in a group of enemies and I'm meleeing and hitting them up in the air and blowing up and shooting and flying. And it was just... It's like it's like a joke, right? It feels like it's a meme of how much there is on screen. I talked about last week uh, the TikTok thing of having so many visual stimuli and this is like that game. This is the game if you want to be visually stimulated to the point of like going into a coma. There are <laughs> there are so many things on screen that you can't even tell what's happening. And the from what I can tell There is a disable HUD button, but I don't know how much that would help because I don't think you can go in and disable individual visual elements like I would expect. You're kind of just stuck with it. And it is very, very overwhelming. Uh, The writing is kind of cringe. Uh, It's a little bit closer to David Ayer's Suicide Squad than James Gunn's Suicide Squad, if if you catch my drift. Uh, The location, it's set in Metropolis, which should be amazing, especially from the people who made Gotham in those Arkham games so memorable. Uh, unfortunately, you spend an insane amount of time on rooftops. They even say right in the beginning of the game, it's too dangerous to go in the street. Don't go in the street. Now, there's really not a gameplay reason for that. I mean, sometimes there's tanks on the ground, but nothing is hard to kill in this game. Everything you can just like demolish. You're a god, effectively. You spend so much time on... like I would say you spend 95% of your time in this game on rooftops. And so you don't really see Metropolis at the ground level... Everything you do, you're just flying from rooftop to rooftop to rooftop. Maybe sometimes it's a higher building, or maybe sometimes it's a lower building. It reminds me of DC Universe Online, which is a deep cut. I don't know if anyone still plays that game. But I remember in that game, running around, I think it was Metropolis, whatever the starting area is in that game when you're a good guy. And it's just like this barren, like empty city and you're just running straight up a building waiting to get to the top of it, it reminded me a lot of that. So you don't really get a feel for the city like you would in Batman, in the Batman games, other than just looking down on it from a rooftop. And there's not enough visual distinction from the different districts, especially in Arkham Knight, they did a great job with that, making each district feel unique. In this this version of Metropolis, they really really don't do that, Um, which is a shame because I think... Metropolis is a great location that we haven't really seen fully fleshed out in a lot of games, especially with this kind of budget. Uh, But anyway, I do plan to finish the main story. It does interest me, sort of. I'm a fan of these characters. You know, I'm a comic book fan. I'm a DC fan. So it is fun to see this scenario play out, even if the gameplay is not fun. I do want to see the Justice League. They do a good job showing how good the Justice League are, like to the point of parody before they all get turned into like demons. Um, so I'm sure they're going to go, you know, a million degrees in the other direction. Once they, once we see these characters in their evil version, uh, we get Kevin Conroy's Batman, which is great. Even though Batman is obviously evil in this, he's killing people, but he's like the, 
he's like the big brother in the game, which I think is kind of fun. He's the one running things on the ground, uh, and you get Kevin Conroy hamming it up as an evil Batman. I know people were disappointed that this is one of his last performances, and and this is how they're showing the character. I you know I really don't have a problem with it. I think it's fun. You can tell he's having fun with it too. I think, he, like I said, he's hamming it up, being this evil like dictator Batman. I think it's fun. Uh, what else do we have here for it? Uh, I just wanted to say, and this is really just for me. Uh, the game is worse than the Avengers game, which is surprising, right? I'm a I'm a diehard fan of that Avengers game. I will go to bat for it. At least in the Avengers game, each character felt unique and had unique abilities. In this game, if you didn't have the character models, right? Where, like if you didn't know you were playing as King Shark or didn't know you were playing as Harley Quinn, the shooting mechanic, you would feel, everybody feels the same for the most part, right? There are very little differences from character to character, which is ridiculous considering it is a multiplayer game. Or, well, it's an always online game that has multiplayer in it. And you can have, theoretically, a squad of four where everybody is playing as their own character, their own unique DC character. And most of the time, it just feels like four goons with guns just shooting people. But yes, the moral of the story here is sometimes reviews are correct, and you should trust them. uh, Because this game lived up to every review that I ever read in terms of it being very middle of the road, in terms of it being boring, in terms of the gunplay. Yeah, all that was correct. <laughs> uh, but those are my thoughts on Suicide Squad and Fallout 76. Um, let me know what you think. I'm, I'm curious if any of you have are getting back into Fallout 76 with the show or if you tried Suicide Squad at launch and, and didn't like it or you did like it. Maybe you're still playing it. doing Because there is a battle pass, by the way. Maybe you're grinding the battle pass to get all your, your Joker skins and stuff. I don't know. But anyway, that's going to wrap up Episode 8 of No Credits Rolled. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, of course, you can always email questions or comments to NoCreditsRolled at gmail.com. We'll always uh, be happy to hear from you. I plugged it at the beginning of the show, but you can always call in uh, and leave us a voicemail at 856-209-0713. That's 856-209-0713. And we might just play it on the air. Make sure to subscribe to No Credits Rolled on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, subscribe, like, leave a review if you can. All that helps us out quite a bit. If you're feeling generous, we do have a Patreon. You can subscribe there, uh, and you can recommend what I should be playing, what I should be talking about. I would love to hear from you as well. But that's going to do it for today's episode of No Credits Rolled. I'll see you next time. Hey.